Hey, 42 here. Do you know what you're eating? I mean, do you really know? Because you may think you do, but you've been lied to your entire life. Now, this may be hard to stomach, but a lot of the food you eat is fake. Okay, this is not true for everyone watching. Different countries have vastly different food regulations, and some countries are far, far worse offenders at dishing up fake foods to its citizens. I'll reveal the worst countries for doing this in a minute. But first, let's take a jar of harmless honey. It's touted as one of nature's superfoods. It can prevent cancer, heart disease, it's a powerful probiotic, and it boosts your immune system. And all of that is true. If you're eating actual honey, that is, Germany is the world's largest importer of honey. Those Germans just love their honey. But the world's second largest importer of honey, America, tells a very different story when it comes to this supposedly wholly natural product. A study found that over 75% of honey sold in the US doesn't contain any honey. According to the FDA, honey has to contain pollen, otherwise it just isn't honey. It was discovered that the vast majority of commercial honey brands on the shelves in American stores contained no pollen at all, and therefore were not actually honey. So if all this honey isn't honey, then what is it? Well, there are many different, carefully engineered cocktails of artificial ingredients that are used to replicate real honey, and each producer uses their own unique mixture. Most are mainly made up from the infamous high fructose corn syrup, sometimes labelled as maltolol syrup, which is cut with sucrose syrup and water. Sometimes some plant extracts and essential oils are thrown in there, if you're lucky. So, you thought you were being healthy by swapping your pancake syrup for honey, but in reality, it's probably the exact same thing. So, why do American honey producers sell billions of dollars worth of artificial sugars labelled as honey? Simple economics. Real honey is expensive. Just think about what has to happen to make honey. Bees have to visit 2 million flowers to produce just one cup of honey, travelling 55,000 miles in the process. And over its entire lifetime, a single bee will produce just half a teaspoon of honey. High fructose corn syrup and other similar ingredients are incredibly cheap to produce, and so companies can sell fake honey for much, much cheaper to consumers, who are none the wiser. There are also no regulations in place in America concerning the actual percentage of real honey content required. In Europe, there are very, very strict rules about what can be labelled and sold as honey. EU regulations stipulate that anything sold as honey must contain more than 60% actual honey. Seems fair enough. And they cannot contain more than 5% sucrose, i.e. syrups. The vast majority of honey sold across Europe was found to be 100% honey. Also, through no fault of their own, Americans are not used to the idea that honey crystallises very quickly, and 100% raw honey will usually already be highly crystallised when you take it off the shelf. But honey never spoils, and crystallisation is completely normal. After all, it is a sugar, and sugar just loves to crystallise. Europeans have always been sold crystallised honey, and so are used to the idea. A survey found that most Americans would wrongly consider crystallised honey to be spoiled. But when you're selling syrups disguised as honey, you don't have to worry about crystallisation. 2.3 billion cups of coffee are drank every day around the world. But what goes into your cup? Let me guess. Ground coffee, or instant coffee if you're an animal, hot water, then maybe milk or cream, and perhaps some sugar. Oh, and of course, let's not forget the wheat, soybeans, seeds, corn, twigs and dirt. Yes, you heard me correctly. Your ground coffee, which should just be coffee, right? 
actually contains a whole array of fillers, and more often than not, these fillers contain twigs and dirt. Well, you did say you like your coffees with an earthy flavour. Coffee is in trouble. Big trouble. Coffee is very sensitive. It doesn't like being called names, but it's also very picky about where it's grown. The plant will only produce coffee seeds, known to us all as coffee beans, in humid and very altitudinous mountainous areas. According to several experts, climate change is threatening these sensitive environments, and forecasts show that by 2050, half of the regions in the world where coffee can be grown will be lost forever. And by 2080, coffee could go extinct. Due to these growing fears, some unscrupulous ground coffee manufacturers have resorted to padding out their coffee using fillers such as soybeans, brown sugar, barley and corn. Some byproducts of coffee production that should really be removed from the final product are also purposely being left in to fill it out, such as wood, twigs, parchment, husks and even soil. If you buy whole beans, then don't worry, there won't be any fillers in there. Brazilian scientists were so concerned about this that they developed a brand new technique using liquid chromatography and statistical analysis that allowed them to detect exactly what percentage of a bag of ground coffee is actual coffee. The procedure is 95% accurate. And what they discovered was that some brands of ground coffee have such a high percentage of fillers in them that they must be purposely added in. There's just no way it's an accident. If coffee isn't your thing, then maybe orange juice is. You may have been told many times that most orange juices are artificial, but do you really know just how artificial? What if I told you that the flavour of most major orange juice brands is 100% fake? To make orange juice, you just squeeze oranges, right? Maybe throw in some preservatives and added sugar. No, that would just be too simple for big brand orange juices. They squeeze their oranges, and then they remove all of the oxygen from the extracted juice. This allows the juice to keep for a year without spoiling. Yes, your morning juice is anywhere from a few months to a year old. But that's not all that removing the oxygen does. It also removes all of the natural flavour, and I mean all of it. So they're left with a very old, completely tasteless liquid that slightly resembles something that came out of an orange once. The orange flavour is then artificially re-added to the juice using a concoction of artificial flavourings. But why purposely remove the flavour and then put it back in again if it only makes it worse? I mean, that's not easy or cheap to do. Well, it's all about consistency. Each big brand orange juice has their own unique flavour that their customers are all very familiar with. Just imagine if the taste of Tropicana changed slightly. Millions of people would notice and kick up a big storm about it all. The natural flavour from oranges is just not consistent enough to stick a brand name on it and have people associate that flavour with that particular brand, because the flavour would constantly change, depending on the variety of the orange, location of the oranges and the time of year. Orange juice manufacturers spend millions hiring flavour and fragrance experts, the very same people that work for large perfume companies, to create a unique and recognisable orange juice-like flavour for their product. They call these flavour packs. And the worst part is that the flavourings don't even have to be listed under the ingredients, because they're derived from orange oils, which is a dubious claim, but it technically means that these artificially flavoured drinks can be sold as 100% orange juice. So, that's orange juice. I bet you're wondering which of your favourite foods I'm going to ruin next. What about a simple steak? No, not the steak. A steak is just a single cut of beef, right? What could possibly be suspicious about that? Well, if you opt for cheaper steaks, whether it be from the supermarket or even your local butcher, 
you could be eating tens of different cattle in a single steak. You're purchasing Frankenstein steaks that have actually been glued together from a whole array of offcuts. And this doesn't just happen with beef, it could be lamb, pork, venison, or any meat really. When many animals are being turned into various types of small food products ready to throw into a pan at home, a lot of waste is created and general chunks of meat that would most likely get thrown away. Some unscrupulous companies and butchers use a meat glue called transglutaminase, which is well known within the food industry and is completely untraceable within the final product. They basically glue together the leftover pieces which could have come from many different cows to create one big Frankenstein steak for your enjoyment. Transglutaminase is so good at fusing meat together, it would take an expert to examine a steak very closely to detect any wrongdoing. The best part? It's not a legal requirement to list it as an ingredient. So to be safe, just stay away from cheap steak. But what if you already do? Maybe you are a cow connoisseur who opts to spend 40, 50 or even $100 plus on a single steak in a restaurant. And your favorite steak of all is of course the very pricey Kobe beef. The Kobe beef craze has taken America in particular by storm. Thousands of restaurants all over the country and many large chains now offer highly prized and highly priced Kobe beef burgers, Kobe steaks, and other Kobe beef products on their menus. Kobe beef comes from Kobe cows, a breed of Wagyu beef that comes from Japan. The steaks they produce are prized by chefs all over the world for their impressive fat marbling, flavor, and that melt in your mouth texture. It is the ultimate steak. But it's incredibly exclusive. Kobe beef can only come from Japan and just 3,000 cattle are deemed worthy enough to be slaughtered and turned into Kobe beef each year. They are all fathered by just 12 highly prized bulls that are considered genetically ideal. Sounds to me like they're trying to create a cow master race over there. Kobe cows are fed beer and sake to improve flavor and every cow is massaged daily to improve its fat marbling. Hell, I want to be a Kobe cow. Now that is some serious dedication to creating a tasty steak. And it doesn't come cheap. It varies, but it will cost you on average about $350 to eat a real Kobe steak in a restaurant. Because supplies are purposely kept small to focus on quality, the amount of real Kobe beef that reaches the US each year would only feed 77 Americans. And yet, millions of Americans are going out and regularly eating Kobe beef in restaurants and buying it from the shop to cook at home for far, far less than $350 per steak. So what's going on here? It is one of the biggest food scams in America's history. As you have probably guessed by now, the vast, vast majority of so-called Kobe beef sold in America is just plain old regular beef that has never even been to Japan. <laughs> it's just outright lying and clever marketing, if you can call it clever. Some farms in America are even now creating fake Kobe beef for much cheaper, often called Kobe beef by those in the know. This fake Kobe is sold to thousands of restaurants and customers pay upwards of $100 a steak for it. But in reality, there are only nine restaurants in the whole of America that sells real Kobe beef imported from Japan. Yes, just nine. And they have a special license allowing them to cook and sell it. The fake food that you consume in the average day is sickening. Your olive oil is actually peanut oil, soya bean oil, and palm oil. Your cheese and even bread contains wood pulp. Yes, wood pulp, which the FDA says is safe to eat. Thanks for the advice, but last time I checked, I wasn't a beaver. Your dried 